Greetings, programs, and welcome to a special episode of the Awesome Friday Podcast. Canadian actor Sean Doyle has been working in Hollywood in both film and television since the early 90s, and in that time has amassed himself a truly impressive filmography. In just the last few years, he has appeared in Hannibal, House of Cards, Fargo, The Expanse, This Life, Cardinal, for which he won a Canadian Screen Award last year, The Comey Rule, and a Star Trek Discovery. In this year's Canadian Film Festival, he appears in not one, but two films, The Last Mark, a story about a hitman rediscovering something from his past, and Ash Grove, a story of a woman who may or may not hold the key to an ongoing pandemic. Here is the trailer for the latter film. We're talking to Professor of Water Chemistry, Dr. Jennifer Ashgrove, one of the many scientists around the world trying to find a solution to the water pandemic. This virus feeds on oxygen molecules in the water that we drink, making water consumption toxic and eventually fatal. Of all the teams around the world, you might be the closest to a breakthrough. Hi, I'm Dr. Lakeland. You feeling okay, Jennifer? I understand you have a bit of a history of having blackouts, is that correct? I know that you're under unimaginable stress. <laughs> Take a little bit of time off, reset your system a bit. It's not possible. I'm just talking about a weekend. We have a farm. That sounds great. Listen, I'm gonna do whatever I need to do to let you guys know that I am okay and to get you off my back. She's, she's in the hammock. Just tell her. That is not an option. Jen? Jason, what's going on? You don't understand. You've been weird lately. I'm a little scared. I heard hushed voices. I am so sorry. What are you doing? Why have you been lying to me? There's a lot going on right now, okay? What is I going can't... on then? You're the scientist they plucked from obscurity to fix everything. Who are you? I don't understand what's going on. I don't remember what happened. You have information locked in your brain that could save the human race. If we don't get it, we're all gone. Ashgrove played as part of the 2022 Canadian Film Festival, and I had the distinct pleasure of sitting down with Sean via Zoom. We spoke at length about the film and what it's like to make a movie during COVID, and because I'm such a huge nerd and couldn't resist asking, we spent several minutes talking about Star Trek. Here now is that interview, and I hope you enjoy it. So uh, I just want to, why don't we dive into the movie. I guess, thank you for joining me today. Um, I always appreciate when everyone actually wants to talk to me. So thank you for that. I've also been a pretty big fan for a long time. True story. The, my, I was a big fan of big love back in the day. And, uh, going back. yeah, going back. And, um, <laughs> my wife's favorite movie is the long kiss good night, which you are in as a police officer, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually in it as not a police officer, as a, as a homeless drunk guy who, Samuel Jackson is hired to pretend to be a police officer. Right. In, right. In a sting operation. Right. And it's a funny, it's not, that's actually a funny story. That was my first, um, you know, my first job on a big film and I was so nervous, but I happened to be, I happened to have like 102 fever that day. I was so sick and I showed up to do that scene. He was, a, he was really, he was really cool. He, he actually was acting with me. I mean, I was just, like a day player with a few lines but he was totally there acting with him but uh everyone thought i was a real junkie that someone had, that the rennie harlan was directing it right <laughs> rennie harlan was a crazy man so they thought oh he just hauled the junkie in or something because i was so sick and they were all constantly having to mop me down because i was just pouring sweat my hair at that point was like down to here <laughs> pretty funny cool that's amazing actually <laughs> um well so what um you're in two films in this Canadian film festival, Ashgrove and The Last Mark. But I'd like to speak mostly about Ashgrove. What attracted you to this particular role? Uh, it wasn't the role, because first of all, there was no role. 
when mm -hmm. uh, Jeremy asked me to do it. But uh, I'm I'm just such a long time huge fan and advocate for Jeremy. Ever since I saw Sex After Kids, mm -hmm. I was I just became completely enamored with him and his. Uh, I wouldn't even say his style because I think his style changes constantly. But just I feel like he really he really tries to look at things from a very unique perspective, and uh, I really appreciate that about all his films. And um, so I just became such a longtime fan that as soon as he wrote me and asked me to do this, I said, yes. And Amanda and Jonas, of course, Jonas and I have worked together in the past. And Amanda and I recently had worked together on a short film about Macbeth that we did, get, did together. I played Macbeth. She played Lady Macbeth, which just ran the festival circuit. And so they all thought of me for, to, to, to come in to the thing. So I was just really happy to work with all of them. I went, yeah, sure. And they went, but you don't know what it's going to be. Or I said, I don't care. Okay, well, you need to know that there's not going to be trailers. There's not going to. I said, I know. I, know, I don't. I don't care. Yeah, it was a really, it, it was a really interesting setup for a project. That's for sure. Loved it. And as I understand it, there was uh, not even really a script, right? Like uh, it was improvised on the spot each day. Is that true? Mm, well, yes, but. Jeremy and Jonas wrote basically the story in terms of having a structure for the film, right? Mm -hmm. And so through about a month of kind of quote unquote rehearsals over Zoom, we met with all of us individually, met with various other partner, other other characters to discuss certain facts that we would set in place, certain given circumstances and history and all that kind of stuff. And but the thing is, it was very selective so that I would meet with Amanda and we would discuss our relationship. But I would have also been told information about us and about her that was relevant to my story that I needed to know, but I couldn't let her know. And so there was all this kind of subterfuge going on constantly. It was like it was like spycraft. So it really was a very involved process of learning. And then we we had to do a lot of research on on our our particular jobs and uh, you know I met and consulted with the bioengineer and so it was a very it was a it was a deep dive actually in order to get to a place where we could show up that day on set and be able to not only improv relationally with our with character to character but also to be able to throw in stuff about the world that we were inhabiting and the and the and the and the jobs that we were doing and that was the that was the part that I think a lot of us were terrified of pretending to be scientists and and have to improvise <laughs> all that kind of jargon you know this film really plays its cards really close to its chest and really doesn't tell you what's going on until fairly late i i hesitate i don't want to spoil it for anyone but there's obviously a big sort of secret happening that three of you are acting around and one of you is not how did you approach that for, like that must be difficult when it's scripted let alone improvised well, I think that's when Jeremy really kind of showed his mastery because we would we would do a take. So yeah, it's hard to talk about it without spoiling it. But there are a number of scenarios for each scene. The scene could be a, a couple things at least, right? It could be it could be. I think I should probably just leave it there because I'll I'll give too much away. But the thing <laughs> is, so we would do a take, and then more often than not, Jeremy would come over and whisper into one of our ears, okay, do option number one, which would be referring to another given set of circumstances. And we were told this, so we were manipulating the scene within the scene without necessarily Amanda knowing it. But we were all on the same page. All of us, all the characters, with the exception of Amanda, knew <laughs> knew what what time frame, what world we were what we were operating in at that moment. So we actually, so in some ways we had more control, but in other ways it was like a real risk and jumping off a cliff and hoping that you can kind of, kind of uh, make that real in the moment. It was thrilling, man. Like I could, I could do this work for the rest of my career. I'd be very happy and working with these people. Uh, I'd be happy to do that forever. I mean, it's just very, it's very satisfying as a performer to, to take a risk and I think I think the most edifying thing a performer can do is surprise themselves constantly or be surprised constantly and so when you're in a situation like that there's there's no other option it, that's going to happen for good or bad 
<laughs> you could surprise yourself that you're just completely dry and you have nothing to contribute in this moment, or you can find some other gear and really, you know, it can be quite exhilarating. It's really interesting work. I think. Yeah. I mean, my next question was going to be, how do you find this improvis improvisational process versus something more scripted, but you already answered the question. So. But it depends though, because if, if <clears throat> yeah, so I loved it. I'm not a fan of improvisation. Improvisation really needs really needs structure, right? Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it just meanders around. I think one of one of the the virtues of this film is that you get a sense of naturalism and spontaneity from the improvisation, but it's not wandering. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, uh, but when you have a really good script, I think in some ways a lot of the same elements can come into play because because a good script works on so many different levels that there's a lot to improvise or explore or discover within those different levels. So that in its own way, it can feel like an improvisation. A shitty script, on the other hand, <laughs> then you're just like, oh my God, what am I going to do with this? There's nothing to explore. There's no, there's no levels. There's no, there's no deeper purpose <laughs> or, or, uh, or dimensions to this. And so I just have to try to be as honest as I can on this one level, which of course is death. And it's the stuff we don't like to watch. And it's certainly the stuff we don't like to do. The fact is. Well, shifting gears a little bit, this is obviously a Canadian production. So is The Last Mark, although I think The Last Mark is set in the United States. And you do a lot of work up here in Canada. Is that a, like a conscious choice? Or have you, like, you're like, I'm going to stay? Or have you just gone where the work is generally well you know in 2010 i mean after big love finished uh we made the decision as a family at that time to move back to canada to just have a, a better quality of life for my kid frankly mm -hmm. who at that point was 10 years old and i have worked in the states since but a lot of the work does come up here a lot of the good work too you know and uh, I've been fortunate enough to get some really good things. And sometimes I've gone down to the States to work. But, you know, when you have a family, then it just becomes, it becomes uh, more of a, an anchoring place. And the work that's closer to home is better. And, you know, I've often thought, do I go back to L.A.? Do I live there? But at this point, it doesn't really matter where you live. Yeah, I think that, I think that moment in time has passed. But uh, yeah, I don't know if it's about can it being, you know, wanting to s stay here and fight the fight for Canadian content. Though there is an element of that for sure. I'm very proud when I do stuff that's Canadian that uh, is exciting and I think can compete on any compete on the world level. But um, yeah, I think it's I think it's always pragmatic, right? It's always you're right. You got to go where the work is. You got to. Uh, you got to find the balance in the kind of work you do if you can, if you're lucky enough to do that. And most of the time, some of us are lucky, and other times we're not lucky. Like it's just a constant roller coaster, of course. But uh, if I, but I'm I'm glad I came back, and uh, I feel like I've I've moved out of Toronto two years ago, and I'm in the country now, and I love it out here. I'm in the Kawartha Lakes. Oh and, yeah, it's uh, a nice. That's a nice part of the world. Yeah, it's very beautiful. So I'm very happy about that. I don't know if I'm answering your question, but no, no, it's all great as far as I'm concerned. We could, we could drink a <laughs> bottle of scotch and talk about that one for about four hours. So, yeah. <laughs> so I guess if you're commuting to Toronto for a lot of your work, uh, where was this one shot? Uh, Ashgrove was uh, shot in, I think it was Kitchener, but it was all you know. That was the first thing we did during COVID, and we bubbled basically for the period of time we were shooting it. So it wasn't like I was commuting or anything like that. Mm -hmm. I went out there, we stayed in the one hotel. We had a floor of a hotel just to ourselves. And then we shot at the farm primarily. Last Mark was shot in Sudbury. So the same thing, you know, I was mm -hmm. up at Sudbury for the period of time, but that's no different than any project. You go away for the period of time shooting. Last year, I did the season of uh, Star Trek Discovery in Toronto. And that was a pain in the ass because... I mean, I don't want to. I don't want to spend five months in Toronto when I'm not working all the time. So I was trying mm -hmm. to travel back and forth as much as possible. Uh, but with so much testing, we were testing up to three times a week. Right? You had to stay on the testing schedule. So 
yeah, that, that's the only challenge of living out of a major urban center, I think. And hopefully when this thing goes away, it's gonna be a lot easier to deal with that sort of thing. But I think there's also, in terms of our industry, there's, I think going forward, there's always gonna be an element of some of the protocols that have come into place in terms of food service and uh, not necessarily testing, but there's different zones now that have been created, right? Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> the zones that are closer to the people who are on the floor working as opposed to the people who are building the sets or that sort of thing. And I think a lot of that kind of stuff is going to stay in place. Which, yeah. you know, some of it's good. Yeah, some of it's good. Some of the, you know, remote remote work options for certain careers, I think is a good thing as well. I'll tell you one thing, though, that's happening for actors is that uh, all this online self-taping business is, it's just, it's like a black hole, man. Basically, uh, I hear everybody talking about it, and I'm on the Actor Toronto Council too. We just came through our negotiations uh, just before Christmas for our new, for the new uh, independent produ producers agreement. And what's happening is that because everyone's taping from home, a lot of casting people are just inviting everybody to tape constantly. So they're getting so many tapes that I suspect they're not even watching the bloody thing, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's a it's a bit of an exercise in uh, hopelessness for a lot of performers. That's what I hear because you're just you're just sending this stuff out into the void and you're never getting any response for it. And uh, and that's something that you know as an actor, I hope that changes because acting really is about like it's a it's a it's a chemical thing. It's a physical thing. It's about like electrons interacting in the space together mm -hmm. and and auditioning. Like with you right now, you're pretending on some level. It's not real. It's not like you're not acting. It's a different craft entirely, you know. And I don't know if you call it a craft. Yeah. <laughs> but, but I hope we get away from that in the future. Well, hopefully we get back to some semblance of normalcy at some point for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um I don't actually have too many more questions for you about the movie, to be totally honest. I don't want to take up too much of your time, but would you would you mind if I asked about Star Trek? If I shifted gears a little bit, being a, a lifelong sure. Trekkie, could uh, how, could I ask what led to Star Trek for you? Star Trek is a, it was a long it was actually a long route because uh, I did a mini series for Showtime two years ago called The Comey Rule, mm -hmm. which was about the whole uh, election of Donald Trump and uh, the alleged the Russia collusion etc cetera, etc cetera. so i did that and uh, that was an amazing experience working with just the toppest of the top drawer people it was fantastic and as a result of that i i auditioned uh, a couple times for the, the male lead of uh, the new series clarice which uh, had the same producers and that didn't go my way and i was very frustrated and had a had a mid-level childish temper tantrum with my agent on the phone and then the uh, creator of star trek alex kurtzman who happened to be one of the main producers on both of the other projects i just mentioned clarice and comey rule and everything else just you know he's one of the biggest guys in hollywood he uh out of the blue just asked me to tape for another role on star trek actually which i didn't get and i got this one which i think was a way 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 better role and then they asked me to do it for the season. I had no idea what it was going to be until I signed up for it and then started to have talks with the showrunner and everything. And I don't know if you watched it or not, but it was a it was a great character. It was a lot of fun and it had a kind of a deep journey. And I, de I definitely watched it. I've I've watched all of the Star Trek. It's, oh, you have? It's it's a thing. Yeah, I've been wow. I've been a fan of Star Trek since I can remember. So wow. Yeah. I'm not a big fan of like I haven't been historically a big fan of Star Trek. You know, I've seen a fair amount of it and I've seen the films, but I was never like a diehard watcher of the series in the past or anything like that. But I'll tell you, I certainly had a newfound appreciation for what those what those performers do and also what those writers do. Mm -hmm. It's it's like a gargantuan task to one, come up with a good story, two, uh satisfy all you fans out there. <laughs> And make sure that you're following the canon and that you're adding to the canon. And three, taking so much world building and exposition and putting that into uh, 
like an entertaining, watchable form. You know, that's that's like it's an amazing feat. Mm -hmm. And I love doing the show. The, the people were amazing on it. So welcoming and inclusive and fun. When you when you sign on for the role of Tarka, who I found very interesting being a uh, and I'm going to get into some jargon that I'm sure I'm going to lose some people here, but a Rysian scientist. <laughs> uh how did you approach the role of someone who's like from a place that historically we as star trek fans we know risa as being a, a sort of hedonistic place and you yeah. play this character who is you know the genius of geniuses in the current era but from that place how did you square those two things in your in your mind and in your performance well in the first episode in, in one of my many long monologues while I'm operating stuff that actually isn't there. That was yep. like the most terrifying thing in the world. I'll tell you showing up that first day <laughs> with a page and a half monologue. And then at the same time, having to manipulate controls that will be CGI in afterwards is terrifying. <laughs> but anyway, in that monologue, uh, I say no one understood me on Risa quote, the pleasure planet. That was, that was one of the lines. And that's really, I just went from there. I think that mm -hmm. I was from a place that I was never ever going to stay at because nobody understood me and I didn't understand them and we were coming from different places and I kind of for me I come from a mining town in Labrador and that was never the person that, that was never the place I was going to stay you know I always wanted to do what I do now and nobody certainly nobody understood <laughs> understood me back then walking around town with my uh, pink shirts and whatnot and but they tolerated me, so I appreciate them for that. Yeah, so that's how I that's how I made that work in my mind. That was pretty simple, pretty simple one. And the character is revealed pretty quickly to be driven by this. Well, maybe not quickly, but driven by this sense of well, loss and grief and love. Did you? Is that something you found easy to draw on, or like did you draw it from anything in real life, or is it just you? Well, I think we can all find substitutes for that kind of stuff. Um, so sure, I, I, I drew on certain things, but it's a beautiful story. You know, it's a story about a person who feels they've never been understood. And finally, the one person who sees them is taken away from him. And he wants to do everything to, first of all, to, to be with that person again, or not even a person, is it? Mm -hmm. Be with that now, what do you call it? What would you call that person? What would you say as a Trekkie fan? Uh, in terms of just like the relationship between your character and uh, I've totally blanked on the other character's name now. That one, that bad fan. Oros. Oros, yeah. I mean, partners. Uh, partners. That's what I mean. You, that's what would I you say like. person? You wouldn't say person because isn't person, uh, isn't person speaking of a human being? No, I don't think so. He's a oh, person. You you Everyone, say. you know, it's uh, my favorite. One of my favorite quotes from Star Trek, uh, even is um, from the Undiscovered Country, and it's even called out in the moment. But that uh, I think it's che uh, Chekhov says that that the Federation believes that everyone has inalienable human rights. <laughs> but mm. he's saying it to a group of Klingons, and they're like, "Really, bro? Right. Like, really?" <laughs> but uh, ulti ultimately, that's I think you know everyone's a person there's another great moment in Picard just to again out how big of a nerd I am where in the first season he's it. been he's been involved in this uh evacuation of Romulus which has been destroyed and he's being interviewed by a what feels like a fairly right-wing journalist and she says why did you do it and he said I say he says I saved 900 million lives and she says Romulan lives and he says lives <laughs> Like, right you know yeah. we're all people we're all you know yeah i think even kirk says it at one point and he says you know you know what we're all human so yeah <laughs> so yeah, yeah. that's what i love uh, i love that about i loved that, that that sense just permeated every element of this this production and shooting you know mm -hmm. uh and that was I, I, as i wrote it i recently wrote a, a just a thank you letter to michelle paradise the showrunner and just said that I hope that I can carry that with me into my other work, just that sense of community. Like it truly did feel like a community. 
And uh, but to get back to your question, I think uh, he he wants to get back to Oros not only for not only because it was the person that understands him and that he understands, but also because he betrays him so deeply that he needs to get back for redemption. He needs to get back so he you know that story about the the scorpion and the frog when the scorpion asks the frog to go across him. Mm -hmm. and stings him at the end and says why would you sting he goes because i'm a scorpion man uh, i feel like i feel it's i feel on some level tarka needs to needs to prove to himself that he's not the scorpion he needs to prove to himself that he he's not only he won't only always betray everybody and everyone that he can redeem himself in that respect so at the end at the end of the season his fate is left somewhat ambiguous do you, do you personally think he made it? Personally, I don't think he did. No, no, no. It's probably not the right. It's probably not the right professional answer to say. But uh, I feel like I feel like he 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 made enough. He did the right thing enough at the end that he could go to his. He could cross over to wherever he's going uh, with some sense of peace that he likely has not had before. But not all, not all the way to Oros. It's a crapshoot, man. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah, I well, certainly tried to play it. I certainly tried to play it like he 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 believed he was going to make it. Yeah. yeah, and I think that came across. So. Cool. That was Canadian actor Sean Doyle, to whom I'd like to extend a huge thanks. It was an absolute pleasure to sit down and speak with him. Ashgrove is on the festival circuit now and will be headed into a wider release later this year. You can find streaming links on this episode's homepage, which will be linked in the show notes and are powered by Just Watch, which means they will update as availability changes. I'd like to thank you for listening. And if you've enjoyed the show, please consider giving us a five-star review on your podcasting platform of choice. Or if you'd like to support us more directly, we do have a Patreon and a Kofi, which you can find in the show notes as well. This episode was recorded and produced by me, Matthew Simpson, on the unceded lands of the Musqueam, tsleil and Squamish Nations. And as always, thank you for joining me on this awesome Friday. Mm -hmm.